Welcome back to the series. In this lesson, we'll change Alice and Bob from computer players to human players. Their hands will no longer be chosen at random. Instead, you'll be able to play as Alice or Bob and choose your own hand. Since we're changing the way that Alice and Bob will generate their hands, we only need to make changes to the front end. We'll change Alice and Bob to be interactive and provide the option to connect to a real consensus network. Let's get into it. We'll rewrite each line again and make our updates. The first, second, and fourth lines are the same as before, but line three is new. It imports a helpful library for simple console applications. It's called ask.mjs, and it's from the Reach Standard Library. A console application is one we use in the console. There's no graphical user interface, but the user interacts with the application using the console window. To start the beginning of the front end interaction, we'll use an asynchronous function. We need to decide who will play as Alice and who will play as Bob. We can interact with the user using the ask function. That's what we just imported. We'll ask, are you Alice? This is an asynchronous function, so we use the await keyword to immediately trigger it. With this function, we expect the user to answer Y for yes and N for no. By passing in yes, no, it will error if the user does not provide a proper input. It'll prompt the user again for an answer, a valid answer. Let's save the result of what the user enters. We'll call it is Alice. The value of is Alice will be true if the user enters Y, Y for yes. It'll be false if the user enters N for no. This conversion is also done by the yes no function. Let's use this variable to create a string of the player's identity. This is called a ternary operator. If is Alice is true, the who variable will get the value Alice. If is Alice evaluates to false, the who variable will get the value Bob. Let's use this to print a message to the user confirming their identity. Before deploying this to a consensus network, we can test this on the built-in Reach DevNet testing network. For this testing network, the user will need to create a test account or they can input a secret to load up their existing account. Let's ask the user if they want to create an account. This will be pretty similar to the question we asked before. We'll use the ask function and save the result in a variable. For other consensus networks, the account creation is more complicated. It's usually done before using a decentralized application. That's why we add this only possible on DevNet clause. No matter what, the user will need an account. We need tokens to wager with. Let's declare an account variable to hold this account. When we declare a variable, we do not initialize it with a value. We simply state that this is a variable and it will likely hold a value in the future. Declaring it here will allow us to access it and set its data later on. Now, if the user said yes to creating an account, we'll want to create the account. If the user said no, we'll want to ask for the existing account secret and retrieve it. We can implement this logic with an if statement. If we should create the account, we'll use the reach standard library to create a test account with a thousand tokens. If we should not create the account, we'll ask the user for the account secret. 
This is a little different because instead of feeding in the yes, no function for input validation, we're feeding in a custom function. This accepts any input and makes it the value of our secret variable. With the secret value, we can retrieve the account. It's important to note that this will be run by both participants. Before, the front end acted as a single front end. It had both Bob and Alice's hands. Now, we're designing this front end so it can be run by Alice on one machine and Bob on another machine. This means we'll only need to create one account in the front end code, since this code will be run twice, once by Bob and once by Alice. Now, in order for a decentralized application to work, a contract must be deployed with the backend application, and that contract must be agreed upon by both participants. The first step in this is to deploy the contract. This must be done by one of the participants. Let's ask if this participant wants to deploy the contract. This will follow a similar pattern that we used for initializing the account. We'll declare a variable, CTC, which is the contract, and then ask a question. If the participant says yes to the question, we'll have them deploy the contract. We did this before by calling contract on the account with the backend passed in as input. This deploys the backend using the account and it creates the contract. Now, we'll display the contract to the user. We'll use ctc.getinfo. The contract is public information and it should be given to the other players so they can join the game. Now, a quick note about this code. It uses something in JavaScript called a callback. Instead of saving the get info in a variable, we use a callback and we say when the information is returned, we'll print it out to the user. Thinking back to the if statement, if the user is not deploying the contract, then the contract must already be deployed. The user will link to the contract. Let's add that else clause. We'll ask the user to paste in the contract info. Here, we use json.parse as the input validation function. It validates that the input is in the proper format. If it's not, it'll error, and the request of pasting in the contract will be run again. In addition to validating the input, it also parses the JSON so that info has a valid value. Once we have the contract information from the participant, we can set the contract. We'll call contract on the account with the backend and info passed as input. Now we're almost ready to start the participant interfaces. Let's create a few helper functions that'll make it easier for us to implement the interact interface. This should look familiar from previous lessons. Let's begin the interact interface. This is how the front end will communicate with the back end. To start off, we'll feed in the standard library has random function. Then we'll add in the timeout functionality. Now this is where the interface deviates based on whether the user is Alice or Bob. If the user is Alice, we'll need to add a wager and deadline to the interact interface. If the user is Bob, we'll want to add the accept wager function. Let's use an if statement to deviate this function. If the user is Alice, 
let's ask Alice how much she wants to wager. Here, the validation and conversion is done by the parse currency function. That's coming from the reach standard library. Let's set the interact wager to this amount. We'll also want to set the deadline. This will not depend on user input, but it will depend on what consensus network we're using. This is because each network goes at a different speed. With this code, we create a dictionary. It contains identifiers for each consensus network and a deadline and time units. ETH is for Ethereum, ALGO for Algorand, and CFX for Conflux. Then, we access the appropriate deadline value using the Reach's standard library connector attribute. It returns the appropriate acronym for what consensus network the backend is deployed to. Similar to how we retrieved the hand and outcome using indices, we're doing the same thing here. We use the acronym to access the associated deadline value. Now, if the user is not Alice, the user must be Bob. Let's define the accept wager functionality. We'll ask Bob whether he accepts the wager. If Bob does not accept, Bob's front end will exit the program. We just have a little more functionality to define, and this is shared by Alice and Bob. It's the functionality of get hand and see outcome. Let's create some variables that we'll use in the git hand implementation. The first hand constant should look pretty familiar. The second hands constant is a dictionary with several key value pairs. This will be used to verify the user's input. It'll map what the user inputs to a number and that number will be used by the backend. If the user inputs a value that's not one of these keys, the user will be prompted for input again. Let's implement get hand. Instead of randomly generating the hand, we'll ask the user to play their hand. Then we'll take the player's input x and retrieve the value for this hand. We'll use our hands dictionary. If the input's not valid, then player hand will have a null value. If this is null, we'll want to error so that the user is asked again for a valid hand. Let's use an if statement to check if the player's hand is null. If player hand is null, we throw an error. This will stop the execution of the function and ask the user to play their hand again. If we're able to make it past this statement, the hand must be valid and we can return it. With the hand retrieved, we'll display it to the user and return it from the get hand function. Now let's create C outcome. There are three possible outcomes. The C outcome function will take in an outcome and display it to the user. The interact interfaces are now implemented. The next step is to link the front end to the appropriate role in the back end. We'll use the ternary operator to assign the backend role we want this front end to execute. If this front end is Alice, we'll give them Alice's role. If it's Bob or not Alice, we'll give it Bob's role. <laughs> 
Now to kick off the backend process, we'll use the keyword await with the correct backend, and we'll pass in the contract in the interact object. We're done implementing the front end. Let's execute our program. This execution will work a little differently because the front end should be executed by two separate participants. Before, we ran a single instance of the front end, but now we'll run two instances of the front end, one for Bob and one for Alice. To do this, we'll use two separate terminal windows. We'll open the terminal using the spotlight and we'll navigate to the tutorial folder. Right now, I'm in my home directory. I'll CD into desktop, CD into reach, and then into the tutorial folder. This is where our reach executable lives, along with our program. From here, I'll create a new tab. This first tab will act as Alice, and our second tab will act as Bob. It's already in that reach tutorial folder. Let's start Alice's execution first. Reach compile. All right, so we have a little bit of an error, and I think that's because we need a semicolon here on line four in order to separate it from the asynchronous function, and we'll try it again. We don't need to recompile because we didn't change the reach code. We only changed the front end. Compiling is only for the back end. This first terminal window will be Alice. So we'll say, yes, we are Alice. We will create an account on the DevNet, and we will deploy the contract. We'll wager 100 tokens. The contract is deployed as 38. Let's start the app on Bob's side. We are not Alice, and we'll also create a new account. Alice is deploying the contract, so we don't need to. The contract information is just 38. And we have that wager. Do we accept the wager of 100? We'll say yes. Now, back to Alice's side, it's time for us to play a hand. We'll play paper. On Bob's side, we'll play paper as well. It's a draw, so another hand is played. We'll play rock as Alice, and we'll play scissors as Bob. Rock beats scissors, and so Alice wins the game. Bob sees this outcome, and Alice sees the same outcome. Alice wins. With this lesson, we turned our application into an interactive program. It accepts user input and uses this input in its execution. Thank you again to Algorand and Reach for sponsoring the series. If you have any questions about blockchain development, please join me in the Reach Discord in the Days of Blockchain channel. I'll see you next time and happy coding.